Somebody in the house ought to be able to say amen today. Come on, say amen like you mean it. Oh, praise God. I'm so glad. No, no. I'm really so glad that he changed me. Turn with me, if you will, once again in your Bibles to the gospel recorded by John. We're going to close out this chapter 4. We've been spending the last, while you're turning to that, we've been spending the last three weeks, last three Sundays, in a sermon series as we uh, entitled Living Water, as we've been taking a look at uh, uh, the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. But in closing out the chapter, it really, it shifts gears and shifts locales and moves from Samaria into Galilee. And we're closing out the, the study of this particular chapter today with verses uh, 46 through 54. So when you found that grouping of scriptures in your Bible, chapter 4, will you say amen? Our focused scripture for today is going to be taken from, uh, I believe it's verse 50 and 51. We have it up on the screen for you in the King James translation. So if you don't mind, let us stand together and read together verses 50 and 51 from the screen, the King James translation. As we read together, it says, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. As you take your seats. We'll be focusing on the title, From Sorrow to Sincere Faith. From Sorrow to Sincere Faith. Uh, John moves us in the, as he spends, as we spend time with Jesus in the life and times of Jesus and, uh, and in the travels here, he shifts our gears once again. And he does that in verse 43 through 45. Let me just read it to you from the Amplified. It says, but after two days, after these two days that he spent with the Samaritans, Jesus went on from there into Galilee. Amplified says, although he himself declared that a prophet has no honor in his own country. However, when he came into Galilee, the Galileans also welcomed him and took him to their hearts eagerly, the Amplified says, and for they had seen everything that he did in Jerusalem during the feast, for they too had attended the feast. Now, I have three life lessons, and it begins with verse 46. So on the screen is a King James. Uh, let me read the Amplified. 46 through 48 says, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son was lying ill in Capernaum. Capernaum, as they would say there having heard that Jesus had come back from Judea into Galilee, he went away to meet him and began to beg him to come down and cure his son, for he was lying at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Unless you see signs and miracles happen, you people never will believe that is trust, have faith at all. Unless you see signs and miracles happen, you never will believe that his trust have faith at all. Life lesson one. Let's just dive right into this, this, this powerful episode. Faith is enlarged as we understand our needs and humbly come to Christ, our solution. Faith is enlarged. This shifting, shifting of the scenery, the shifting of the, uh, of the landscape, it's interesting in the way Jesus sets it up, uh, John sets it up in talking about the travels of Jesus, and that he it makes it a point to let us know and come to understand that he's moving now out of Samaria where they, well, we spent time the last three weeks talking about uh, the, the, the mindset, the conflict, if you will, between uh, 
the Samaritans and the Jews, uh, and specifically as we spend time with the woman at the well, uh, she uh, basically asked the question, how can you, a man, be asking water of me, a woman? How can you, a Jew, be talking to me, a, gent a, a Samaritan? Uh, you can get a sense of the, the friction there, even between uh, those sharing a border. And he makes the point to make it clear to us that that even though a prophet is not without, receives no honor in his own home country, as he came into Galilee, into Cana, there was, uh, there were, they welcomed him and eagerly their hearts were open to him and they were, uh, they were happy to see him. But he focuses in on this point. They were happy to see him because they had seen the signs and wonders. And with that as a background, he began to, begins to launch into the story that is taking place in these few short verses. And he lets us know that there, again, there's a, there, there's an, a gentleman who's come, a, a man of honor who's come, whose son is dying, and he's heard about Jesus. He's, he's heard about the miracles. John reports in the, the closing of the second chapter, of this second chapter, how in Jerusalem they, they got excited about the signs and the wonders. It's a, it's not unusual to get excited when God does something miraculous and visibly miraculous in your life. And, and, they, and they got excited about seeing the wonder-working acts of Jesus. And the word clearly began to spread across the countryside to the point that even in, in Galilee, uh, the, 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 the word is now bubbling up that, that Jesus is doing things that... Uh, that no man has done before. They, he's performing miracles that, that are unique and wonderful and, and almost mystical in their abilities. He, he, he must be somebody different. He, he must be a, a, a prophet of, of greater acclaim, if you will. And, and this word begins, gets to the ear of this man who has a son who is at the point of death. And he does what I believe most parents would do. He wants to get to Jesus, whom he's heard about, who is performing all of these miracles. I, I, nobody can fault him. I mean, if you, if you have children or if you, even if you don't have children, there's something in your heart that lets you know that if your son, your daughter, if your child is struggling, suffering, certainly at the point of death. If, if you've done, I mean, he's a man of some means, so he's, he clearly has done what he could do in trying to find medical help for his son. I mean, you know you're going to exhaust every avenue, every opportunity. Somebody talk to me like I'm, I'm, I'm in Trinity this morning. You, you, you're going to find every way, every step you can take as a parent to make sure that your child has what he or she needs uh, in order to be cured from whatever the ailment might be. And, if, and when you reach that point where it seems like that all that you've done uh, uh, is, not, is not providing an answer to the problem, then, then you know how it feels when your heart begins to sink and it, it looks like the very one that you, that you, the very child that you love so very much that God has blessed you with is in the process of slipping between your fingers, slipping out of your arms, and then he's not even old enough to have experienced life yet in any degree. That you, you know how your heart gets heavy. You, you know how your mind is searching for answers. You just want to find a way to get an answer for the difficulty that's in your life. And he heard about Jesus. It's rumbling through the countryside, the miracles that he has performed in, in Jerusalem. Cana, they... Uh, they, they, they might have remembered the, the wine at the wedding feast. Uh, I, he heard about Jesus and he comes running. He does what I believe that we would, we would normally do with a heart that's, that's seeking an answer for a situation in which we feel helpless. We look for the solution beyond our physical, mental, emotional abilities to comprehend. We, 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 look, for, we, we look for a miracle. So he comes to Jesus, and he begs him to come down. He begs him 
to come to where his son is so that he might, his son might be cured. His thinking is pretty clear. If, if you would just move from this location over to where my son is, the locale of where my son is, if you can just touch my son, if you can be in the room with my son, if you can pray over my son, if you can bless my son, if your, your very presence, your, maybe your very touch would be the thing that would heal my son. He's, he, he's, he's operating on the level of his understanding in the midst of a dynamic and, and overwhelming need in his life. And he says, if I, 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 I hear great things about you and I, and, and I have a, a need that I cannot handle. If you can move from the locale that you are to the locale of my need, then, then maybe my son can be healed. Maybe there is hope for my son. And Jesus does something interesting. Did you notice how this text shifts? Jesus moves from, from the need into the teachable moment. He shifts the dialogue dramatically uh, by, 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 by taking him to, to this life lesson, if you will. He says, unless, <laughs> unless you see signs and wonders, not just talking about him, talking to the audience. Unless you see signs and wonders happen, you will never believe, you'll never have faith at all. It's not as if he's unsympathetic to the need, but Jesus is now expanding his spiritual vision and his understanding. Let, let me talk to you like we're, we're family here. There will always be folk who will come who want to know your Jesus because of the miracle things they see. Are oh, y'all going to make me preach now? You, you can get excited about watching a crusade on TV, a prayer meeting on crusade. You know I'm going to meddle, don't you? You can get your heart all thumping and pounding when you see, when you, when you see the... Uh, uh, the praying or when you see them come on up with the crutches and kicking their crutches to the side and walking on down. You can get all excited about folk who all bent over and on TV and uh, miraculously they straighten back up. You, you can get all happy when folks start saying, I couldn't hear out of this ear you know, all the rest of my life. And, and I came to the crusade and you just, I heard a word from you on TV and, I, and, I, and my ear unplugged and, and suddenly I could hear, I'm not talking, let me help somebody here. Hey, you can get all excited about signs and wonders, but Jesus said there's something more powerful in your faith than having faith in the signs and wonders because the, the danger is, can I preach over here? The danger is that we as humans will fixate our focus and our faith. You don't mind me teaching, do you? On the sign and the wonder rather than on the source of the sign and the wonder. Can I, can I preach it? And if I were expanding the text, the danger, a part of the danger in focusing on the miracle itself rather than the miracle worker is that the, the enemy has an ability to counterfeit. S somebody's in the house. You, you read in your Bibles, you, you know the enemy can find a way to counterfeit the miracle. So Jesus is moving him from, he's, he's empathizing, sympathizing, understanding, relating to the need that he has, but he's seeing something much more bigger about to happen here. It's not just about, it is about, but it's not just about healing the son. God has a, the God man has a bigger picture here that's taking place. And the life lesson, he's told us in the opening verses here, the folk in Galilee are happy about me being here, not because of who I am, because of, but because of what I did. They heard about the miracles, and they got happy about the miracles in Jerusalem. So they're happy to have me among their midst if I can work some miracles. If I can put on a little sideshow for them, in other words, he might say, then, then they'll get sure enough happy about that. And so he's, he's taking them to the life lesson. Our faith is absolutely enlarged. When we first of all understand that there is a that there's need needs inside of us larger than our ability to handle, and we need a God, we need God to handle for us. 
the second piece of that is that we, we need not get ourselves all focused on the event. Yeah, yeah. We're not blinded. We're not, we're not, we're not going to step aside from the event or the need. But the most important piece of this is the relationship with Christ. It's understanding the source of our blessing, the solution to our hopelessness and our helplessness. And every now and then, God has to take us to a moment where he first of all humbles us and teaches us so that we can then be receptive to the greater blessing that is about to come. I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And so 49 takes us to the next piece of the, the dialogue. Amplified says the king's officer, after getting this teachable moment with Jesus about signs and miracles, pleaded with Jesus. Amplified. Do come down at once before my, my child is dead. And in 50 it says, Jesus answered him, go in peace. Your son lives, will live. And the man put his trust in what Jesus said and started home. Life lesson two. Blessings are received as we trust God and his word and we follow him obediently. Is this getting plain enough, fam? The need is exposed. The teachable moment is shared, and now the blessing is received. Notice how Jesus does this. The man comes back and pleads again with Jesus. As if Jesus is saying, now have you received and understood the life lesson that you just had? He allows him to step back once again and make the request. And the request still is narrow. The request still is narrow in his composition. He still sees miracle workings as a local event. What am I saying? You have to physically be there, Jesus, in order for the blessing to take place. Jesus once again stretches his, sp his spiritual eyes, expands his vision in the midst of expanding his faith. This is going to mean something to somebody. When he tells him, go, your son lives. He doesn't say, I'm coming. I'm, I'm not going to meet you there. Let's, let's talk about who it is you're talking to, and the ability of Jesus to handle the stuff in your life. It's, I don't need to be on the premises. Uh, there were some miracles when he came to the site, but this miracle, he wanted to make it powerfully plain because the bigger picture of the audience standing by is that you, you, you've come out here to see me. You've come out here shouting and praising because you saw, you heard about the miracles that took place over in Jerusalem, and you love the signs and wonders. Well, if I'm contrasting you to the Samaritans that I just dealt with over there, they came out to see me because the Samaritan woman had told them about him speaking, understanding what was going on in their lives. And when they came to see Jesus, they accepted who he was, not because he did miracles, but because of his word. Am I in this? I'm still in this fourth chapter. And so he gives them this powerful contrast in a short verse. He says, now, you Galileans are students of the word. You'd be criticizing the Samaritans over there, but the Samaritans accepted me for, without seeing the miracle, and you've come looking for signs and wonders. Am I preaching this? Family, the Lord is trying to enlarge our, he's, he's enlarging our faith and understanding. And, and we need to hold on, we need to grab and hold on to this. He's a miracle working God, absolutely. He's a signs and wonders God, absolutely. But he's God whether he's, whether he's performing signs and wonders or not. 
And he does not want us to get focused on the event, focused on the activity to the point that we miss who he is, the relationship, the strength of the relationship is in our, our intimacy, our relationship with, with God through Christ Jesus and our ongoing fellowship with him. And if he never performed a miracle in your life at all, he's still all that you need. So our tendency is to do what? We, 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 we can relate to the brother here. Our tendency is to find ourselves in a difficult moment. I'm going to drive into your neighborhood. Do what we can do with our, through our own resources and intellect. God's graced us and given us the blessing to be able to, to understand the will to do that. So if my son, if my child is at the point of death, I'm absolutely going to exhaust every single thing, avenue that I can exhaust mentally, emotionally, physically, resource-wise. I'm going to do whatever I can possibly come up with, with, with all that's around me to get the very best care, whatever's needed on that. But the reality is, it is God who's going to determine the outcome of the event. And whatever my need point is, my solution is in the relationship and the fellowship. It's like a seek ye first moment, digging. It's very much like a seek ye first moment. The kingdom of God and, and all in his righteousness, then all these things can be added unto you. So as he's maturing us, as he's moving us, we get to walk alongside this king's officer here. And Jesus once again says to him, Here's the test of your faith. Go. Your son lives. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then go. Take the step of faith and trust in the word of God. S -s -somebody, somebody's grabbing it here now. S somebody's catching it just for a moment. Let, grab hold of it. If you believe in the word of God and the promises of God, then you can step out on faith in whatever the area of your need may be. I, I don't know what's going on in, uh, in your life right now. I, I don't know what's happening with what you have dialogue with the Lord about behind closed doors. I don't know the, ang the, the weight of the anxiety that's on your life. I don't know the fears that are attempting to crush you down. I don't know what feels like it's, it's, it's got you weighted down and worried about the, the day in and day out of living. But I do know that my God is able to handle any single thing that you're going through today. And when God says, you can take a step of faith and I'll handle your business. Take a step of faith and trust in the promises that I made for you. Take a step of faith and know that I've got all this stuff in the realm of my sovereignty. Then our only response, and faith is an action term, our only response is to move beyond the intellectual and step. S somebody's been paralyzed in the house. I'm going to get to this last life lesson. Somebody is right at a moment where you're feeling like your need is crushing you down, and you're not sure what the next step is. You've been praying about this thing. You've been doing what you know to do about this thing. You're waiting for the Lord to give you an answer to the thing that you're struggling with in your journey and your walk. Right now, you can feel, you, you, know, you know God is good, but the flesh inside of you is struggling with the thing that you're dealing with right now. Talk to me, somebody. And Jesus is saying to you, I'm still in charge. The Lord is saying, you don't need to worry. Don't, don't, be, ang don't be burdened down by your worry. But come to the Lord with prayer and thanksgiving. And watch how he moves powerfully. I, I love this. It's so simple. It's so powerful. And so, and so few, so, so few words. 
when he says as he, to the man, go, your son lives. And the man put his faith in Jesus and in his word that was spoken unto him. And he took the step of faith and went his way. No argument, no dialogue, no questioning. Come on, talk to me, somebody. He didn't start, he didn't, he didn't start quizzing Jesus down. He wasn't upset that Jesus had just given him a tutorial on true faith and true belief. He turned. He did what we ought to be doing when God gives us a, gives us a function and a direction, opens up a vision for us and gives us a pathway. It may be out of your need or it may be out of opportunity. But when God, when the Spirit of God speaks to you and the Lord speaking to his Holy Spirit and he says, go, then the thing you need to be doing is putting your face toward the blessing that God has laid in front of you. Now I'm talking about when the Lord says go. I'm not talking about when you say go. <laughs> and you walk, you take a step. No time for dialogue. God's not interested in your opinion. You need to step out on faith. It's a powerful thing to trust God enough to take the one step. That first step had to be the hardest. I'm telling you, it had to, somebody talked, that first step had to be the hardest. I'm here and my son is dying. I'm here in front of a miracle worker and my son is dying. And I've asked you to come down with me. Don't, don't send me off without you. I'm, I need, if nothing else, you could hear him saying, I need the support of you walking with me between here and my home. Because between here and my home, my heart might give way. My, 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 my fears might start welling up inside of me. You, you can relate to this man, can't you? I, my faith might start to break down somewhere between here and my home. And I need you to walk with me. And Jesus says, but, but I'm, trust me in my word. Because the word of God is powerful. It'll take care of all your needs. And he says, go. You know that first step. Deacon, you know that first step. From face to face with Jesus to turning, th th that had to be the hardest step in the flesh. But his face said, this, this must be the God, man. Your son lives. And as the text says, and as he was walking, the servants met him on the road and reported, saying, Your son lives. Blessings are received, I'm telling you. As you put your trust in God and his word, and you follow him obediently. The storyline closes out this way, 51 through 54, amplified. But even as he was on the road going down, his servants met him, reported, saying, Your son lives. So he asked him, At what time? At what time had he begun to get better? And they said, yesterday, during the seventh hour, about one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him, the precision of God. <laughs> then the father knew that it was at that very hour when Jesus had said to him, your son lives. And he and his entire household believed. Uh, they adhered to and they trusted in and relied on Jesus. This is the second sign, the wonder-working miracle that Jesus performed after he came out of Judea in the Galilee. Final life lesson, if you're jotting, is this. Transformation is experienced and expanded as we share and walk in the good news of Jesus Christ. As we share and we walk in the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus had told him to go. He trusted Jesus enough. Trusted in the power of his word enough that he turned and he walked toward his blessing. God loved him enough to confirm the truth by giving him analytical evidence. He knew the man.
And so when he asked the question, what time did my son rise up? It's as if the Lord said, go on and try me. I, 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 let me give you the pastor's paraphrase. It's, it's as if the Lord, as if the Lord is, is looking forward and saying, now I'm going to give you an opportunity to confirm that step you took. Because I know that there in you is a hunger for confirmation. There's, a, there's, a, there, there's this area in your flesh that might be exposed to some of the temptations and the fears. And while you're walking, I, you, you, may find yourself, you may find yourself just getting a little bit weak and, and want to turn back and run back to Jesus and, and see, if, and see if, if you got the message right. You know, you know, you know how we, can I talk to you? You know how we do. We, we ask the Lord for the blessing, and the Lord says, this is the step I need you to take. Somebody's going to understand me. We, 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 get, we, get the, we get the word from the Lord, and we, we take that step out on our blessing. But because the blessing hasn't occurred immediately in our eyesight, we get two steps down the road, and we begin second-guessing ourselves. We begin second-guessing the Lord. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves turning around is, and, and questioning the God who told us to step out on faith. Don't we do that? And the enemy's slick enough to know, all I got to do is toss a little arrow dot in there. Let me distract you from the blessing he's told you you're going to. How about if you have a flat tire on your way home? <laughs> you know, let, let me sidetrack you for a moment there. You know, t toss a little something along your way and see if your faith is still holding up. And so I love it that the Lord looked inside of his heart, and he does this for us too, and, and saw the, he saw the need. And so he, I believe that he sent the servants out to meet him along the roadside. Am I preaching this thing? H help me out, doctors. <laughs> I believe he sent the servants out along the roadside to give him confirmation on the way to the house uh, so that his faith will remain strong before he got there. I, I, don't, I don't know if you can handle this. <laughs> As if he's saying, I don't know if you can, you, you can handle this. Your, your faith is here, but, but you're still a child in your faith. And so you may, get, you may get weary on the road, so let me send you some confirmation. And, he, and, and Jesus didn't even remove the blessing after he asked the question, what, just when did that happen? You know this is an analytical brother here. Let me, let me pinpoint. It's not enough that he's already blessed me. What, what was the time? Come on, talk to me, somebody. <laughs> you, you know, what, what, when did that, tell me when that happened. And the Lord is anticipating all of this stuff. And he puts it, the servants give the testimony to the moment that he takes place. And his faith is enlarged again because now he understands that God is not, not only in the big blessing business, God is in the details. God, God, wait a minute. God is in the details. He, he's in the details of, of the stuff you're dealing with. He's, he's in the minutia of the things you're going through. And when you know that God is in the, in the small pieces of the things that you're handling on a regular basis, then you can sure enough start getting happy because there's nothing that goes beyond his ability to see, understand, and deal with in your life. And here's the beauty of it. When, 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 the, when, the, when the, 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 the king's officer gets the blessing and it wells up and his faith is enlarged, he takes it home and he witnesses to his family. So the transformation is not only experienced, it is now expanded. This is a good model for us, brethren. As the Lord is blessing in our lives, we, we need to make sure that we're carrying that good news, first of all, to the primary source of our ministry, which is our family. Don't, 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 don't get all happy and running all out in the street evangelizing everybody else. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm not mad at you because you're out there knocking on doors. 
But I mean, you ought to at least be sharing the gospel at home. They ought, they ought, there ought to be some, they ought to be, they ought to be hearing this from your lips at home. They ought to be seeing it transforming your life at home. The brother came home, and there was a change, and she, and, and, and the unnamed wife and family in this scenario has to see, not only has the son now living up on his feet and strong, but when he tells him about the Jesus that he just met, when he talks about how he told him to just go and walk and your son shall be living, as, as he tells him, don't focus on the sign and wonders, but focus on me and the blessing will come in the midst of the relationship. Then it says the whole household trusted in and relied on Jesus. That's a good news ending to a sorrowful moment. And God is able to take you from the moment of your sorrow to a powerful encounter of sincerity and faith. And he knows every detail of the journey in your life. And so faith is enlarged as we understand our needs and humbly come to Christ the solution. Blessings are received as we trust God and his word and we follow him obediently. And transformation is experienced and expanded as we share and walk in the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. As you experience that, share that. And watch how God will utilize his word your experience, and fresh new opportunities to bless into the lives of unnamed, untold, unnumbered people. Are you ready for that, church family? Are you ready for that? Let's bow. Father God, I just want to take the moment and thank you again for blessing us with this opportunity to come together in worship and in praise and fellowship and in study. I thank you, Lord, for your family here. Continue to open up the doors for us to be able to touch lives in the precious name of Jesus. We pray that you'll strengthen us. Mm, thank you, Lord. That you will gird us up, Lord, that you will open up our eyes, our spiritual eyes, to see all that you would have us to be and to do. And send across our path those that you would have us to share this good, good news with. Help us to have faith enough to take the one step. And trust each step that you call us to take. In Jesus' holy name, we pray that all God's people say amen. As musicians come, we're going to open up the doors of the church in the invitation to you if you're here. Become a part of the Trinity family. This is our invitation time it's a simple step in the process of coming down front and letting us introduce you either on your christian experience or as a candidate for baptism either way we're family this is your moment and our arms are extended to you as we stand together the lord is moving on your heart when you take a step of faith and let us introduce you to the congregation as new family members new life abundantly Deacons will join me. Elder, if you'll join us. You can have eight minutes.
as we prepare to enter into another phase of worship. There are a couple of things I'd like to say as, as the young ones come in. The first thing I'll say is that Rev preached the word today. The next thing I'd like to do is invite you to, no, no matter what position you are in, no matter what your role is, I invite you right now, if you are first a believer, I invite you to move out of a, an audience mindset, and I hope you understand what I'm saying, and move into a mindset where God is the audience, and you are lifting up your heart to him. I'd like to take you back 2,000 years to the night that the night before our Lord was crucified. You know, and sometimes we tend to focus on the passion of Christ, the crucifixion, and, and this is really about that, but there are some significant things that occurred the night before he was crucified. Certainly there was a dinner, a supper, one that we refer to as the Lord's Supper. Significant conversations took place at that supper, and I just invite you to take a look at the Gospels and familiarize yourselves with what took place, the conversations that took place. But in those conversations was one that we hold on to and we celebrate, such as we are about to do. At supper, where Jesus is surrounded by his disciples, after they had eaten, he took a loaf and he blessed it and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you and after they had eaten he took a cup and he said this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we, we do this. And many of you are familiar with the Apostle Paul. He said in Corinthians, I believe, chapter 11, he said, examine yourselves. So before before you partake, I invite you to examine yourselves because you do not want to take this supper unworthily. Not that we are worthy within ourselves, but it is the power of the Lord which enables us to be able to take and to eat. Join with me as we ask the Lord for his blessings on the elements that we are now about to receive. Father in heaven, we just come. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship you again. Father, thank you for what you you allowed your son to go through on that cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for stretching out your hands, for allowing the nails to pierce your hands and feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for 
taking that beat, that beat that we deserve. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood so that we might be redeemed. Thank you, Lord. We come today just asking, Lord, that you would bless each and every one of us in a special way. Father, as we partake of these elements, we just ask, Lord, that we turn our minds and our hearts to you and strengthen us as believers, Lord, to go forth and to do what you would have us to do. Father, we just ask that you would glorify, that you be glorified through our actions and through our words and through our deeds. And we know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that can happen. Father, we ask your blessings on these elements today. Bless the wine. Bless the bread. Bless the partakers. And we ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let everyone say, Amen. believer, no matter if you are a member of this church or any other church, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, we invite you to participate in this supper. And we also ask that you would hold your elements until everyone has been served.
body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, broken for you. Let us eat together. The blood of our Lord and Savior shed for the remission of your sins. Let us drink together. Scriptures share that after they had shared the Passover meal, they went out toward the Mount of Olives, singing a hymn as we recovered the used cups. is mine. 